Deadly Doris, a weather bomb of storm force winds and snow batters Britain. At least one person is killed after part of a roof is blown off a shop in Wolverhampton. Winds of more than 90 miles an hour bring down trees and cause chaos on roads across the UK. As soon as the wind got it, lifted it up. That was it, I was gone. Couldn't hold it. But you're all right? Yeah, yeah, I've just got a slight bang on the head. As planes are grounded and trains delayed, we'll have the very latest on how Britain was blown over by Storm Doris. Also tonight, a fall in the level of net migration, but it's still way above the government's target. Jailed for life, Helen Bailey's wicked fiancé who killed her for her money. Naomi Harris for services to drama. And what one Bond girl said to another when Miss Moneypenny went to the palace. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. Storm Doris has caused chaos across Britain today with winds of more than 90 miles an hour, heavy rain and snow. Right across the country, roads and bridges were shut, power lines cut and many train services cancelled. And there was tragedy too. In Wolverhampton, a woman was killed in the street by a piece of flying debris. Ben Chapman will be live with more on that in just a moment. But first tonight, Damon Green on how Storm Doris battered Britain. Storm Doris arrived, leaving trouble trailing in her wake. Passengers hoping for an easy landing at Manchester Airport found their planes approaching the runway at a crazy angle as pilots fought the wind. This one thought better at even trying to land here. The length of the coast where the gales came in, the high winds were causing difficulty for travellers, however they were trying to get around. It was first thing this morning with gusts of 100 miles an hour predicted the decision was taken to close the port of Liverpool for the safety of its contractors and its customers. The wind may have abated slightly in the last few hours, but conditions on the roads across the northwest of England are still as hazardous as ever. The advice from motoring organisations today was to drive with care, but however much care drivers took, there was no guarantee of safety. The winds were just too strong, the hazards too unexpected. In Lincolnshire and Cambridgeshire, hundreds of miles from her landfall, Doris still packed a punch, overturning this truck on the A1, the driver counting himself lucky to walk away in one piece. I was going to turn round at the next one and go and park up. It just, as soon as the wind got it, lifted it up. That was it, I was gone. The dash there that's hit me on the head. And then they had to get me out through the window. To some, the weather was a chance to go sightseeing, but the danger was never far away. The waves in Dorset almost caught these walkers by surprise. Nobody expect to walk to work through Liverpool city centre to leave them flat on their back, but today was the day. Of course, the damage that Doris has done to property will take time and money to repair, but many of those who escaped injury, or worse, can count themselves lucky. Damon Green, ITV News, on Merseyside. Well, Ben Chapman is in Wolverhampton city centre where a woman was killed after she was hit, apparently, by flying debris. Ben, what do police think happened? Well, this woman was doing what many of us would have found very tempting on a day like today, enjoying a hot drink at lunchtime outside the Starbucks here when something flew off uh, one of the nearby roofs and hit her. One eyewitness described it as a piece of wood about the size of a coffee table. Now, the woman suffered what ambulance crews described as very serious head injuries, and despite their best efforts, they couldn't do anything to save her, and she died here in the streets. Now, this road, which was busy with shoppers at the time, has been cordoned off all afternoon as firefighters cleared other loose materials from the building. The work to clear the street is still continuing this evening. The woman is thought to be in her 20s. Police have said tonight that her family have been told about her death and they're now being comforted by officers. OK, Ben Chapman in Wolverhampton, thank you. 
Well, the effects of Storm Doris were felt in many parts of the country. The Met Office said a top wind speed of 94 miles per hour was recorded at Capel Keirig in North Wales. Thousands of homes were left without power in Northern Ireland, particularly in southern counties. And in Scotland, central and southern areas were battered by blizzards and heavy snow, causing accidents and forcing the closure of many roads there, as Paul Davis now reports. Large parts of southern Scotland awoke to discover that Storm Doris had transformed the countryside and turned road travel into a frustrating and potentially hazardous business. In Renfrewshire, emergency services were inundated with calls to help drivers caught on icy roads. Driven by strong winds, several inches of snow fell in some places but it was the ice that closed several routes and caused drivers to abandon their vehicles. And it wasn't only minor roads affected. This was the M80 linking Glasgow and Stirling this morning. The height of the rush hour and no one rushing anywhere. The unwanted award for frustrating journey of the day was probably shared by thousands of drivers held up for much of the morning on the A9 near Glen Eagles while jackknifed lorries were being cleared. The response was generally stoic. It is what it is. It's the weather. You can't do nothing about that. Most parts can look forward to a better day tomorrow, but southern Scotland remains on alert for more snow and ice. Paul Davis, ITV News. Many cross-country rail services have been cancelled and Virgin Trains have told passengers to try again tomorrow. And Duncan Golastani is outside King's Cross station right now. So, Duncan, what's the situation for travellers tonight? Mary, it's not looking good for people trying to head north by train this evening or indeed those wanting to come south. Here at King's Cross, we haven't seen any services leaving on the East Coast Main Line, so that's affecting people wanting to get to Doncaster, Newcastle, Edinburgh and all the stations in between. And it's a similar story just up the road at Euston Station, absolutely packed in there with people waiting for information. They've been in there for hours, but again, no services leaving on the West Coast Main Line, so affecting Birmingham, Liverpool and again onto Glasgow and the stations in between but it's not just the north south routes of course but many of the local lines in between have been disrupted many of the train companies are simply saying don't travel this evening your tickets will be valid tomorrow of course that's easier said than done for many of the people who are already stranded waiting at stations wanting to start their journeys okay duncan golastani at king's cross thank you our latest weather forecast follows this programme and stay up to date throughout the evening. And tonight is on, on the weather and travel disruption. Go to our website, itv.com slash news. Let's move on to other news now. Net migration fell to its lowest level for two years in the months after the Brexit vote. The latest figures show it fell below 300,000. That's still way above government targets. More Eastern Europeans are leaving the UK, but it's not yet clear if Brexit is the cause. Our political correspondent Emily Morgan heard the views of people in Peterborough. At Radio Star in Peterborough today, listeners are being asked to email in their views on living in the UK. The Polish radio station serves the large Polish community across the country, and I sat in to listen to the debate. How do you feel about living in the UK at the moment, especially after the referendum? I think, you know, feeling a little bit upset, betrayed, and um, kind of unwelcome here. That was Agnieszka Sobieraj. I went to meet her. She's a nurse who says Brexit has prompted her to leave. For quite a long time, uh, people from the European Union, they've been left without uh, any kind of uh, guide what is going to happen to us. So I was thinking um, Ireland because of the one of the reasons is the language. Net migration, the difference between the number of people arriving and leaving the country, fell to 273,000, partly due to the number of Eastern Europeans leaving the UK, up 12,000 to 39,000. And international student applications were down, dropping by over 40,000. But the number of migrants from Romania and Bulgaria is at record levels, up to 74,000. The government, which aims to get immigration below 100,000, is encouraged. 
What these numbers demonstrate is that there is a welcome form from the non-EU migration, so that it demonstrates that we can reduce immigration where we can control it. Peterborough has seen huge levels of immigration in the last five years. Some residents aren't convinced by the reduction. I don't think it has. No, I don't think it has. I, I think the, the immigration rules have been so lax, it's not really gone the way it should have done. In truth, it's too early to say what's prompted the change. It could be Brexit, it could be the drop in the value of the pound, or it could just be the natural cycle of events. Emily Morgan, ITV News in Peterborough. Our deputy political editor, Chris Ship, is here. Um, Chris, what can we read into these figures? <laughs> uh, well, listen, net migration has fallen, clearly, but remember it's fallen from that really high 330,000 it was in the last set of figures, but still way, way off the government's target of uh, 100,000. And I think Emily was touching on it at the end there. Why has it happened? What we can say is the numbers going back to Eastern Europe, countries like Poland and the Czech Republic, uh, more are emigrating, so 40,000 of those went home. Now, that could be because they're earning less money here now, remember, because the pound is so much weaker than it was before. But it could be, as uh, Emily's report suggested, they're feeling a little bit less welcome here. It hasn't, however, stopped those coming from Romania and Bulgaria. Those numbers are up to, to, to quite a big level. But, you know, we talk about a lot during this campaign about taking back control. Remember this, the government's target's 100,000, but there were 164,000 people that came to this country from outside the EU, an area the government can already uh, control. So that's, I think, a key point to say that, you know, the government's not doing well on all areas. OK. Appreciate it. Thank you. Voting is underway in by-elections in Copeland and Stoke-on-Trent Central after the sitting Labour MP stood down there. In Copeland, Labour defends a majority of just over 2,500 and in Stoke, a majority of more than 5,000. Polling stations will close at 10 o'clock this evening with results expected in the early hours of tomorrow. The partner of children's author Helen Bailey is starting a 34-year minimum jail sentence tonight for her murder. Ian Stewart was told by a judge that he'd brought her life to a cruel end, just as she was at the height of her success. He said it was hard to imagine a more heinous crime. Richard Pallo reports. Cowardly to the end, Ian Stewart refused to even listen via video link as he was sentenced. In his cell, though, this evening, he will have plenty of time to contemplate how for murdering Helen Bailey, a woman who loved him, he will be at least 90 years old before there's any chance of parole. Why? I don't understand. What happened? He lied for three months before this, his arrest, for seven months after, and continues to do so still. That, along with a significant degree of planning and premeditation, contributing to the length of incarceration. Judge Andrew Bright QC said, I am in no doubt this is a clear case of a murder done in the expectation of gain with aggravating features, which make it difficult to imagine a more heinous crime. He went on to state that the world has lost a gifted author and her family and friends will have to live the rest of their lives with the deep sense of loss your wicked crime has inflicted upon them. I think it was a very fair sentence. It uh, gives an indication of, uh, of the wicked nature of Ian Stewart. 34 years will mean he'll probably spend uh, the majority of the rest of his life in prison. Helen's brother John was in court and was satisfied with the sentence passed. He heard the judge conclude that Stewart poses a real danger to any woman with whom he forms a relationship. 34 years in jail should ensure that no one will ever be at the mercy of Stewart as Helen Bailey so cruelly once was. Richard Pallow, ITV News. So to come on the ITV Evening News, we challenge the cosmetics industry over the children being used to mine minerals for makeup. And Miss Money Penny OBE, Naomi Harris, honoured at the Palace for her work in film. Those stories and more after the break. Join me then. Welcome back. Last night, you may remember, we reported how children as young as six are mining mica, the mineral which is used to give cosmetics their sparkle. Shamil is breaking rocks at an Indian mine so that the Western world can sparkle.
The largest mica deposits in the world are here, and yet, according to the locals, all the mining in this area is illegal. Well, tonight, ITV News can reveal that although the cosmetics industry has long known that child labour is a real problem, it still cannot guarantee that it's not used in its products. Our consumer editor, Chris Choi, reports on how much mica is in your makeup. This is the consumer's most intimate brush with mica, and in Britain's £8 billion beauty business, it adds sparkle to many cosmetics. It's really been pushed by manufacturers at the moment. Uh, all the looks are very highlighted on the cheekbones, even down the nose. What do you think the reaction of the makeup industry and its customers is going to be to this? Like myself, I think they're going to be absolutely horrified when they find out uh, what's been happening about exploiting young children. And I think that they're going to want more answers. ITV News has spoken to the big cosmetic firms. Owners of Maybelline, L'Oreal, says its supply is now almost completely secured, using legal gated mines only. Esther Lauder says less than 10% of its mica comes from India, and it's spearheading an effort to reduce child labour. Rimmel says its mica supplies are asked to comply with a code of conduct. Boots 2 told us its supplies provide specific assurances no child labour is used. For consumers wanting more product information, it can be a lot harder than you might think. Sometimes the ingredients are on the underside of the label. They're often in tiny print and frequently the language is inconclusive, just saying there may be mica. This industry knows that ethics is a far more important ingredient than sparkle, so it's worked for years to tackle the mica problem. But the substance is also used in car paint and electronics, so the head of a new responsible mica initiative says others must now help. You know, the cosmetic industry, they do their part, but they represent only more or less 2% of the Indian production. We need automotive brands, we need electronic brands to join forces and join the responsible MICA initiative. Cosmetic firms know the task is huge. They think it could take five years. Around 25% of world production of MICA comes from illegal collection and that's a potential image problem for an industry that thrives on the way things look. Chris Choi, ITV News. And Chris will be answering your questions about, the, about Micah and your makeup live on Facebook, and that's straight after the programme. Now, an inquest has heard how a 10-year-old who died in a Topshop store was killed by a queue barrier that fell over and struck him on the head. Caden Reddick from Reading suffered fatal head injuries whilst he waited for his mother to pay. Following the incident, Topshop has removed all similar barriers at Tills. And an underground bunker built in the 1980s to shelter from a nuclear attack has been housing a cannabis farm. Six people were arrested following a raid on the bunker in Chilmark, Wiltshire, and a million pounds worth of cannabis was seized. Now, the boss of Peugeot has told ITV News his company will honour all existing contracts if it takes over Vauxhall. It comes ahead of his meeting with the government tomorrow about the future of the UK company. Joel Hills is here. So does this mean, then, that the UK factories are safe? No, and it's because PSA and uh, General Motors Europe operation want to get together, but this is not a marriage of equals in any way sense. The French company today announced record results. GM Europe's operation is persistent and heavily loss-making. It needs help. There will be change. And today in Paris, the French boss of... Uh, sorry, Portuguese, actually, of the French company was asked, could he guarantee jobs in Britain? This is what he said. I want to tell my, uh, my British friends that uh, we care about the iconic Vauxhall brand and we want to nurture the Vauxhall brand. So what I want to tell them is that all the agreements that have been made so far by uh, the previous management, if this deal was to be concluded, those agreements will be respected.
OK, so that is a commitment to the contracts at Ellesmere Port and Luton, which run for at least the next four years. But it's not a long term commitment to either factory or indeed to making cars in Britain. And here is why people are worried. We also learned today that PSA Group, which makes Citroen and Peugeot, is running its factories, Mary, at 90 percent capacity. By contrast, GM Europe, which makes Vauxhall and Opel cars, is running at 70 percent capacity. So, so Vauxhall, which employs four and a half thousand people in Britain, has has more factory space than it needs and a takeover which may get concluded actually at some time next week gives the opportunity to close a plant. Top of the list will be Ellesmere Port. The boss is in town tomorrow. All right, Joel, thank you. And finally, actress Naomi Harris came face to face with a fellow Bond girl, the Queen, today as she received an OBE for services to drama. And this weekend she'll be rubbing shoulders with Hollywood royalty as she hopes to pick up a different kind of award at the Oscars. She spoke to our arts editor, Nina Nana. Naomi Harris for services to drama. They've both worked with James Bond and today one, the Queen, was honouring the other. She asked me what I was working on next. She congratulated me on all the success with Moonlight and she wished me, wished me all the best for the future. It's lovely in pink. <laughs> this is just really phenomenal because this is representing my country and being recognised for being, having made a contribution to the nation, which is, it can't get better than that, really. I may have a shot. Miss Moneypenny in the last two Bond films, Harris is waiting to hear the details of the next, but says there's a very good chance Daniel Craig will return with her as 007. Though, of course, it was not Harris who joined him on his most famous stint on Her Majesty's Secret Service for the opening of the 2012 Olympics. Of course, the Queen has had her own Bond cameo. Yes. She must have been very aware of that when she was meeting you again this morning. <laughs> I hope she was. But what I, I was really impressed by is how um, youthful she looked. She looked incredibly young and really healthy, and she has lovely skin. That's what I was most impressed by. <laughs> Why you didn't come home like you're supposed to? Huh? And who is you? Meanwhile, Oscar voters were so impressed with her, she's got a nomination for the film Moonlight yeah. and heads off to L.A. tomorrow. What a week from OBE to Oscar. Nina Nana, ITV News at Buckingham Palace. And that's all for now. The all-important weather forecast is coming up next and Tom Bradby is here with News at 10. But from me and all the team, have a great evening. Bye-bye.